See, that's how that's this statement is true. You could fill a room. The world could contain the books of what Jesus did in 33 years, but the world cannot contain the books of everything that Jesus has done since the beginning. So I have, I actually have points this week, even though we're gonna still read a lot of John's story, a lot of scripture, I have points. I only have two, and here's point number one, John's divinity. So we're gonna look at that part of John that was, that he allowed the divine to use him in the kingdom. First of all, I need to tell you some things about John. John wrote five books of the Bible, and he was the third as far as words to the, to the Bible. Okay. Now, when we talk about the Gospel of John, I need to explain something to you about it. There are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic Gospels. John is not a synoptic gospel, and I want to explain to you why. Uh, the word synoptic, I love words, and I hope you do too, but the word synoptic comes from the word synonym. Uh, it means similar or same. It doesn't mean exactly the same. It means similar, okay? So you need to understand then that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are similar gospels John is not. Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote their gospels before John, and it is entirely possible that John read those gospels and then decided to write John because he wrote about things that are not in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote about the birth of Jesus, the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, and in between, they wrote about uh, his, the third year of his ministry. Let me tell you something about John. John begins with the birth of time. The whole book of John is nowhere else in the Bible. It, it's amazing. Do you realize the first book that is translated by Bible translators today for new languages of the Bible? Would anyone like to guess? It should be easy to figure this one out. John. Do you realize what theologians tell people if you can only give, tell someone, a new, a new believer or a seeker, where to read in the Bible? Tell them to read the book of This is divine. This is divine. John is the red letter gospel. Did you know that? More red letters in John than any other book of the Bible. John tells us more of what Jesus said about himself than any other Bible, book of the Bible. John has more of Jesus' words in that one book than any book of the Bible. Gosh, this is good. I, I don't know... Are, are you not jumping out of your skin right now how good this book is? This, it's, it's, it's incredible. John, John is the I am book of the Bible. Did you know that? By the way, that Jesus did something that made the Pharisees very, very mad. There are two ways to say I am in Aramaic which was Jesus spoke Aramaic and then it was translated to Greek and Latin and then to English and then other language of the Bible, Spanish and all sorts of, I mean, of the languages of the world. But, but he spoke in Aramaic and there are two ways to say it. Uh, and, and one is I am, like I am going to the store. But the other way comes from the Hebrew word, which means I am God. So every time Jesus said, I am, he wasn't saying, I am the door. He was saying, I am God, the door. I am God, the bread. And he made the Pharisees very mad. So let me just give you the I am's. John, now they're going to be fast. So John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. John 10, 7, I am the door. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine. John 8, 58, before Abraham was, 
I am. And that's the one for I am God, for sure. And John 10, 36, in case you ever wondered, he says, I am the Son of God. He straight out says, I am the Son of God. And it, without the book of John, we would have not had the I am's. Gosh, I am one of the best preachers in the world. This is amazing. This is amazing. And do you know, do you know, listen, do you know why I say that? I, because it surprises me too. It surprises me more than you, I promise you. I am human, and yet I am divinely used by God, and you're a human, and you can be divinely used by God. I hope you get that through your mind because you work with people I don't work with. I can't reach them, but you can reach them. Oh, I'm getting pumped up. I'm just going to preach this a little bit. You know what else John gave us? The new commandment. A commandment from Jesus himself. Nowhere else in the Bible. Not, not in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. John 13, 30. Sounds like I'm really getting on to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, aren't I? But I'm not. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you. That you love one another. Can you imagine if the body of Christ around the world the different denominations, the different sects, the different beliefs, if we just loved one another. Je Matter of fact, here's what Jesus said. By this, the world will know you're my disciples. Not that you have correct doctrine, but that you love one another. Do you know why I have people stand in this pulpit that might not be from the exact same background that I'm from because they're part of the body of Christ. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. For us. Let me tell you something else about John. He's the only disciple that wasn't martyred. But let me tell you something interesting about him. They tried to martyr him, but he wouldn't die. They put him in a cauldron of boiling oil and he preached. He came out of the boiling oil with no burns. Just like, the, just like Shadrach, Meshach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, didn't even smell like smoke. I heard a young preacher, he preached, and sometimes they don't always pronounce biblical names correct. He preached on my shack, your shack, and a bungalow. <laughs> That's funny, isn't it? I don't care who you are. That's funny. My shack, your shack, and a bungalow. Do you know what else they did, which a lot of people don't know? After they put him in the boiling, the pot of oil and he didn't burn, they made him drink poison and he didn't die. So then they banished him to the island of Patmos where he wrote another book of the Bible. Which, by the way, I told you this when I preached on the seven churches of Asia Minor. Um, it is not, and it, did I call, I call it the seven churches of Revelation. I think I called it, so if you want to look it up. Um, but it is not the revelation of end times. I'm so sick of hearing about that. I'm so sick of Christians waiting for the bus to come. We ought to be winning the world to Jesus Christ. Jack Hayford said, uh, there are two things we know about the, the second coming. Number one, he's coming. And number two, nobody knows when. Because Jesus himself, nobody knows. And listen to what he said, I don't even know. Only the Father knows. So when somebody tells you they know, they don't know. And But here's what Jack said. He said, I actually think Jesus might have come back years ago, except somebody might have figured it out, and God went, shoot, I got to change it again. Because <laughs> when he does come, nobody's going to know when. Nobody. 
but we should be winning the world of Jesus Christ. John lived to be over 100 years old. John took the mother of Jesus in, Mary, because Joseph had already died, and she lived with him until she died. He lived in Ephesus. And history tells us that in the last five years of his life, he only said three words, but he said them over and over again. Love one another. Love one another. One day, again, this is history. This is Tertullian that wrote this. They spotted John at the temple, the synagogue, coming to worship. Many of the Jews had believed in Jesus. And they said, it's John. It's John, the only disciple left. It's John. And they said, please come to the front and tell us about Jesus. Wouldn't you have asked him to come tell you about Jesus? The only one left who had walked with him. They said, please come tell us what it was like living with Jesus. Please tell us what you remember most about living with Jesus. And he walked to the front of the church. And he said three words. Love one another. And then he literally walked out. He felt like he had said what God told him to say. And then he passed away a few months or years. We're not sure later, but we think of it could have been a few. Could have been his last three words. I attended the memorial for Billy Graham. 2,000 people were invited. 70,000 asked to come. <laughs> By God's grace, I was one of the ones that was invited. I was on the fourth row. The four rows in front of me was the President of the United States. Two rows behind me was a governor that came up to me and told me she watches me on TV. I sat there and I listened, and one of the men that spoke was Billy Graham's pastor in the last five years of his life. He didn't speak very much. By the way, Franklin Graham's a good friend. I asked Franklin, uh, he, he gave me Dr. Graham's last book, and I said, is there any way you could ask your father to sign it? He said, I really don't know if he can. I don't know if he's able anymore, but I will. For you, I will. He sent me a note, and I have the note, and I have it framed. It's got Billy Graham's signature. You can't hardly read it. It's kind of a doodle. And he sent me a note that said, this is the last book that my father ever signed. But I was sitting on the fourth row, and they... Um, the pastor, his pastor, from his uh, the last five years of his life, it's a very small church, Billy couldn't attend service, so the pastor would go to his house and preach a sermon to Billy personally on Saturday and then go to preach it on Sunday. He preached his sermon one week, and the, when he finished, he said, Dr. Graham, this is actually one of your sermons. He said, you preached this in 19 so-and-so, and and it broke the attendance record in whatever Colosseum you were in. He said, but over 5,000 people accepted Christ when they heard this sermon. And Dr. Graham, he said, did not speak to him for those last five years because he couldn't speak. But when he said over 5,000 people accepted Christ, Dr. Graham went like this. It was all him. See, when I read about John, there was something divine in his life. He was named Jesus. Now, it's not going to take me long to cover this part, but John was also human. You like to see John's humanity? I'm not making fun of him. I'm just, it just makes me feel good. Luke recorded this. John didn't record this. He didn't write this part. (laughs) 
Luke 9, verse 51, now it came to pass when the time had come for him, that's Jesus, to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they, the Samaritans, did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them like Elijah did? <laughs> that wasn't divine. <laughs> Jesus even said it wasn't divine. He just didn't use those words. He said, you don't even know what spirit you're of right now. He said, I didn't come to destroy people. I came to save people. And then here's the other thing I think that's funny. I believe the Bible's inspired. I believe it's inerrant. I believe all that. I just believe that God wanted me to read Matthew's version of what he saw. And he wanted me to read Mark's version of what he saw. He wanted me to read Luke's version. He wanted me to read John's version. So I believe God partnered with humans. Do you, under, you understand? So I believe, I believe totally in the inspiration of scriptures. You know that. But I just think he wanted us to read these things, and I, I think humans wrote the Bible, but the Holy Spirit inspired them. But I just want you to notice how John, what John wrote about himself. John 13, 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. <laughs> I was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, just, just, just for a minute, just come on, let's just be human about it. What if I told y'all, I just want y'all to know, I'm the pastor whom Jesus loves. <laughs> Sounds a little arrogant, doesn't it? Not even I'm one of the pastors. And by the way, he loves all the pastors, and he loves all the people, and he loved all the disciples. But I'm the one whom he loved. <laughs> John 21, 20, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. But just notice who wrote this. <laughs> Peter didn't write this. John wrote this. Who had leaned on his breast at supper. John 19, 26, 27, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved. <laughs> then Jesus appears to Mary in the garden after he ascended, after he, uh, not after he ascended, after he resurrected. And verse 2 says, Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. <laughs> Five times he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Then watch what, then, then watch this, this next part really gets me. So Peter therefore went out and the other disciple. <laughs> Just want you to know I'm so humble I don't even name myself. And we're going to this tomb. So they both ran to the, the, together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. Why did we need that in the Bible? That Peter was, that John was faster than Peter. I won the race, by the way. And he, stooping down and looked in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in because he understood it would not be polite to go in. He did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, who's like a big ox. I just think that's kind of what he's saying, following him, and he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first. <laughs> Went in also, and he saw and believed. I was the first one who believed. And then in John 21, Peter says, I'm going fishing. And so they go fishing, they don't catch anything, and then Jesus is standing on the shore. And this is the first time they've seen him. They didn't see him when they went to the tomb. Only Mary did. First time they saw Jesus, he's standing on the shore, and they're not, they're about 200 cubits off the shore, which would be about 300 feet. And so they, 
G Jesus says, have you caught anything? They said, no. He said, put your cash your nets on the other side of the boat. Says they caught 153 fish. And watch this. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved <laughs> said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, parentheses, for he had removed it. He was naked. He was fishing naked. Again. <laughs> or in his underwear, or one or the other. Why, why do we need to know that? <laughs> and Peter plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat. We had to take the little boat. For they were not far from land, about 200 cubits. Watch, dragging the net with the fish. He could have said, with no help from Peter, I might add. <laughs> so I had to bring the net in with the other disciples. But Peter, he didn't help at all. See, here's what we learned from John's humanity. We found out he was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He was faster than Peter. He worked harder than Peter, and Peter fished in his underwear. <laughs> now, I just want to show you these two things. We're going, to, we're going to end on this. These two verses get mixed up in the Bible, and I think because we don't understand that they're talking about two different things, we miss one of the greatest truths in the Bible. He ends John 20, chapter 20, with this, these two verses, and then he ends John 21, which is the end of the book, with these two, but they're not the same. You need to know that. John 20, he says, and, only, and truly Jesus did many other signs, watch, in the presence of his disciples. That's 33 and a half years which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. He's telling us that's why I wrote the book, so you would believe. But notice he said there were many miracles and signs he did in the presence of his disciples. In other words, in 33 years, which are not written in this book. But it's not the same as what he says after this. Please watch this. John 21, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. By the way, that's how we know that John wrote it. And I could go into the theological explanation, but don't have time. And we know that his testimony is true. Now watch this. And there are also many other things that Jesus did. He doesn't say in the presence of his disciples in this verse. He doesn't say in 33 years. He says there are many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. And by the way, amen, remember me, doesn't mean so be it. That's a layman's uh, definition. It means this is true. This is true. Listen to what he's saying. Remember, John started his book within the beginning. He's telling us that Jesus is God. Here's what he says. There are many other things that Jesus, since the beginning of time, had done. In every person's life, could you imagine if you wrote, if you could write down everything that Jesus has done in your life? And every person's life in the world? See, that's how that's, this statement is true. You could fill a room. The world could contain the books of what Jesus did in 33 years, but the world cannot contain the books of everything that Jesus has done since the beginning. And that's where John starts. Here's what John is actually telling us. In these two verses, he was a human for 33 years. But he's divine forever. Here's my point.
Do you remember where we started with John about his humanity? Would you like us to call down fire from heaven and consume them? Okay. John was a human divinely used by God. And you are a human that can be divinely used by God. That's what I want you to do. Hey everyone, I'm Pastor Robert, and thank you so much for watching my YouTube channel. Be sure to share what God is teaching you in the comments below so that it might encourage others. And click the subscribe button and then tap the bell icon so that you'll be notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget, you can watch full episodes anytime right here on my YouTube channel. Thanks again for watching. Thank you.